You're listening to Gullum Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at gullaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash gullaminstitute. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, continuing with our sessions on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a siratul nabawiya, the prophetic biography. In the previous session, or rather, in the uh, previous few sessions, we've been talking about the initial stages of prophethood, the beginning of the preaching of the revelation, and we specifically in the previous session addressed the issue of when the da'wah, the message, went from its first to its second stage. That it went from just prophethood and nubuwa, the Prophet ﷺ just coming to terms and internalizing uh, basically what was being sent down to him and the instruction that was being given to him, to where he switched over to actually now preaching the message at a more public level. And we specifically talked about when the Prophet ﷺ got the leaders of his family members together and delivered the message to them and told them exactly who he was and what, why he was doing what he was doing. And we talked about the response as well. We talked about how Abu Lahab disrupted the situation, broke up the party, and kept causing problem day after day after day after day. We finally then moved on to talking about, and some books of Sirah do state it in the opposite order. Some of them say that the public address from the Mount of Safa was first, and then the private dinner with the family members was second. That the private dinner with the family members was done to basically quell any concerns that they may have to kind of have a one-on-one, some FaceTime. While some books of the seerah say, no, it was actually the gathering with the family members was first. To first break the news to them so that they wouldn't be caught off guard. They, this wouldn't be out of the blue to them. And then the Prophet ﷺ took it to a more public arena where he stood at the mountain of Safa and he proclaimed this message to basically all of Quraysh, the extended family, which would be the other tribes and other families in Quraysh. Now that the Prophet ﷺ proclaimed this message publicly in the private family gathering and in the public address of, from the mountain of Safa, Abu Lahab at both places disrupted the party. He basically dispersed everyone. He came back at the Prophet ﷺ and attacked the character of the Prophet ﷺ. He called him a liar, he called him crazy, he reprimanded him publicly. And everybody dispersed from there. What's very interesting is that while many people did not speak up in support of the Prophet ﷺ, in the public gathering it was Ali radiallahu anhu. <clears throat> and one other narration tells us that it was Abu Talib, which we'll talk about a little bit later today. <clears throat> in the public gathering, nobody really spoke up in defense of the Prophet ﷺ. But at the same time, nobody else spoke up against him either which tells you a little bit about that they were hesitant to attack the Prophet ﷺ because this was somebody that they really had no grounds to attack. There was no dirt that they had on him. There was nothing to really attack about him. This was a man of the highest caliber, the highest character, the greatest nobility, total honesty, truth, trustworthiness. What was there to say about him? They really couldn't say anything about him. Abu Lahab was very irrational which we'll talk about some of the irrationality of Abu Lahab in today's session. But Abu Lahab was irrational. Nobody else spoke up in defense, but nobody else attacked the Prophet ﷺ either. Not everybody else shook their head and said, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Abu Lahab, you're right. He's out of his mind. Nobody said that. Everyone just quietly walked away from there. And even that has been explained. Why was that? It's very simple and easy to understand. Because what the Prophet ﷺ was presenting to them was a complete shift in ideology, in theology, in lifestyle, in morals, in ethics, in character. The Prophet ﷺ, this is actually, this speaks about the nobility, the sincerity, and the integrity of the Prophet ﷺ. You know a lot of times, and, and there definitely is a fine line here, I don't want to give anyone the wrong idea, but this fine line can be better delineated by people of knowledge and wisdom and experience, leadership, but at the same time, I will say one thing, that a lot of times when we 
realize that there's an issue in society. And we want to go about and addressing this issue in society. We oftentimes have this discussion, this dialogue about how to address it. Do we tackle the issue head on? Do we say, look, this is a problem and we cannot tolerate this any longer, we got to fix this. But then from the other side, we also have the angle of, oh, but we have to have hikmah, we have to have wisdom, we have to be very wise, we have to be intelligent in how we're approaching this. And that is definitely true. Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawidatil hasanati. We do have to be wise, we do have to be intelligent. But at the same time, we also have to understand that we can fall prey to another extreme. While we don't want to be harsh, and we don't want to reprimand people for the sake of reprimanding people, we have to be careful not to fall prey to the other extreme. And the other extreme is where we basically do not stand on any type of moral grounding. We have no moral grounding. We have nothing that we stand for. We have nothing that we are based on. We, we, we become so wishy-washy, we become so um, watered down about what we're doing and what we're saying and what we're trying to achieve and accomplish. We don't even remember what we set out for to begin with. These are definitely two extremes. We, the Prophet ﷺ is the ultimate balance in this regard. Shaykh Abul Hassan Ali Nadwi rahimahullah ta'ala in his analysis of the seerah has actually in detail laid this issue out. And he's talked about this. And he speaks about how the Prophet ﷺ is the ultimate role model. For anyone who aspires to community leadership, for anyone who aspires to influence humanity in a positive way, wants to make a positive change in the world, wants to be an agent of change in the world that they live in, that the Prophet ﷺ is the ultimate role model. Because the Prophet ﷺ was very wise, he was very balanced, he was very kind, he was very generous and very considerate of people. But at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ stood for what he exactly believed in. The Prophet ﷺ stood for what he believed in. And his convictions were unshakable. And he did stand for something. And that was without a shred of a doubt. So the Prophet ﷺ at the same time is not watering down his message. He's telling them exactly the crux of the matter. Believe in one God and there is a life of the hereafter. And I am the messenger of God. I've been sent to warn you. And if you do not listen to this, you do not heed this message, you bring upon yourself suffering in this world and the next. وَقَدْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِخَيْرِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ And I have come to you with all that which is good of the, the good of this world and the good of the life of the hereafter. So listen to what I'm saying. فَاسْمَعُوا Listen to what I'm saying. In fact, <clears throat> we're going to talk about some of the narrations. But now that the message was public, when the Prophet ﷺ would even go to the public places, he would go to the town square, he would go to the marketplaces, and he would want to try to talk to people about the message. You know, the line that the Prophet ﷺ would open with, he would say, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, Qulu la ilaha illallah. Say la ilaha illallah. Say there is no one worthy of worship but God, but Allah alone. Tuflihu, and you will find success. Look at the power with which he would even open his address. So the Prophet ﷺ is a beautiful, excellent, amazing, a perfect role model on exactly how to influence change in a society. And because of the directness and the honesty and the integrity of the Prophet ﷺ delivering the message, it was something that was initially a little difficult for people to swallow. It was a little difficult for them to deal with. And so everyone dispersed from there, while they did not speak up in defense of him, but because of the character of the Prophet ﷺ, they also couldn't say anything bad about him. Now that this was basically what had happened, what occurred after this point on? What started happening after this was, now that the news was out in the open, there was really no secret, the Prophet ﷺ started preaching, started teaching, started talking about his message. And similarly, people who opposed him, first and foremost, beginning with his own uncle Abu Lahab, he also began to openly oppose him, and criticize him, and slander him, and insult him, and vilify him, and demonize him in the eyes of the people. And there are multiple narrations which talk about this, that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa it talks about his convictions in preaching the message. 
It said, Istamarra yad'u ila Allah ta'ala laylan wa naharan wa sirran wa jiharan. That he consistently kept calling people to Allah, night and day, quietly and publicly. لا يصرفه عن ذلك صارف ولا يرده عنه راد. No one could turn him away from it, and no one could stop him from doing it. لا يصده لا يصده عنه صاد. No one could prevent him from following through with his message. Yet to be on nasa fi andiyatihim wa majamiyatihim wa mahafilihim, he would go and he would meet with people in their public gathering places, in their um, in their business and marketplaces, in their private gatherings. He would go and he would meet with people and talk to people. Wa fil mawasim in the big like what we consider like fairs. You know, we have like the state fair of Texas, or you have a carnival, or something like that. So when these special carnivals or fairs would occur, the Prophet ﷺ would go, and there he would speak to people. وَمَوَاقِفِ الْحَجِّ And he would go at the season of Hajj, when all of Arabia would gather together for festivities, for congregating, business dealings, display of arts and crafts and poetry. The Prophet ﷺ would go there and talk to people. يَدْعُو مَنْ لَقِيَهُ He would call the people that he would meet. مِنْ حُرٍ وَعَبْدٍ Free people and slaves. وَضَعِيفٍ وَقَوِيٍ Weak people and powerful people. وَغَنِيٍ وَفَقِيرٍ Rich people and poor people. جَمِيعُ الْخَلْقِ فِي ذَلِكَ عِنْدَهُ شَرَعٌ سَوَاءٌ All of the creation of God was somebody that he... Turned his attention to. He did not give everyone, anyone priority over another. He not, didn't um, neglect any particular demographic in society. All of humanity was an arena for the Prophet ﷺ to present his message. وَتَصَلَّتَ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَى مَنْ اتَّبَعَهُ مِنْ أَحَادِ النَّاسِ مِنْ دُعَفَائِهِمْ الْأَشِدَّاءِ الْأَقْوِيَاءِ مِنْ مُشِّكِي قُرَيْشِ بِالْأَذِيَّةِ الْقَوْلِيَّةِ وَالْفِعْلِيَّةِ And Basically, very powerful, very powerful, wealthy people from the leaders of Quraysh who were insistent upon their shirk, their worship of idols. They opposed the Prophet ﷺ and they basically began to oppress anyone who would dare to follow the Prophet ﷺ, particularly the weaker people who would follow the Prophet ﷺ. وَكَانَ مِنْ أَشَدِّ النَّاسِ عَلَيْهِ عَمُّهُ أَبُوْ لَهَبْ And the most severe in opposition against the Prophet ﷺ and his followers was his own uncle Abu Lahab. اسمُهُ عَبْدُ الْعُزَّى بِنَ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ His name, his actual legal name was Abdul Uzza. Uzza was one of the idols of the Quraysh that they used to worship. So his actual name, his given name was Abdul Uzza. He was the son of Abdul Muttalib, a direct uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, his father's older brother. He was called Abu Lahab. And it's mentioned here in the narration, but basically he was called Abu Lahab because of his complexion. He was very light in complexion, but he was no, said to have very, like his cheeks were very red. That was his complexion, and he was also a very intense individual. When he would speak, he would become very intense. And his face would become very red. And so Lahab is literally what is called a burning amber, a red burning coal. And so he was called Abu Lahab because his face would look like it had like a fire inside of it. And he was very wealthy. And he was very rich. And he was very powerful and influential. He had focused most of his energies. He was a, considered a leader of Quraysh at some level, but he was not a civil leader like Abu Talib was. He was not very he was not a civil leader. He wasn't very active in the service of his community like Abu Talib was. Abu Lahab was more of a business leader. He committed the majority of his energy to succeeding in business, in the business arena. So he was a he was a leader economically of Quraysh. And that's how he was leveraging his power and his influence. And his wife was known as Ummu Jamil. Her name was Arwa bint Harb. Bin Umayyah. Uhtu Abi Sufyan. She was a sister of Abu Sufyan. So you can see they were a bit of a power couple. Abu Lahab, powerful businessman, head of you know the the businessman's, you know, uh 
club or affiliation or alliance in Quraysh in Mecca. His wife is the sister of Abu Sufyan, the daughter of Harb bin Umayyah. So she's also a very powerful woman. I talked about this in the very early sessions of the Sirah, where I gave a layout of what Meccan society, Arab society was like. And I talked about how women, generally speaking, did not have rights. Women were not treated very properly at that time. But this was not a general rule. There was an exception to this. Women who were of very high lineage, women who were from the families of the leaders, like the daughters and the wives and the sisters of the leaders of Quraysh, they did enjoy a, a very elite status. They did jo enjoy an elite status in Mecca, in Quraysh. And they were actually somewhat influential. They had the ear of their husbands and their brothers and their sons, uh, and, and they were able, and their fathers, and they were able to influence policy. And so the wife of Abu Lahab was no different. She was a very influential woman. She's the wife of Abu Lahab, one of the wealthiest women, the wife of one of the wealthiest men in Mecca. She's the sister of Abu Sufyan, who is a political leader of Quraysh and of Mecca, and therefore of Arabia. All eyes are on him. Her father was also a very influential man. So you can now imagine the level of influence this woman has. And so both of the, these individuals, this couple, Abu Lahab and his wife, uh, Ummu Jamil, or Arwa bint Harb, they basically made it their life mission to oppose the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Lahab started deriding, started publicly degrading, started publicly insulting and slandering, hum trying to humiliate the Prophet ﷺ. Arwa, this woman, the wife of Abu Lahab, took it upon herself to make his life difficult. She would go into, she would throw tr her trash. It's actually said that Abu Lahab was the neighbor of the Prophet ﷺ. He lived next door to him. She would go and she would throw trash on the doorstep of the Prophet ﷺ. When she would see him in public, she would pick up dirt and she would throw it on the, on the clothes of the Prophet ﷺ to make his clothes appear dirty so that no, people would look down on him. And she started making the life of the Prophet ﷺ very, very difficult. And she started talking bad about the Prophet ﷺ. And this is basically what they committed their life to. They started opposing the Prophet ﷺ. There are interesting narrations in which Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal rahimahullah ta'ala mentions in a narration in his musnad that a man reports that then this is before this man accepted Islam. Rabi'ah Rabi ibn Ibad, he reports, and this is before he was Muslim, later on he accepted Islam. رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم في الجاهلية. I remember seeing the Prophet ﷺ before I accepted Islam, in the days of my jahiliyyah, before I accepted Islam. في سوق ذي المجاز, I saw him in the marketplace. وَهُوَ يَقُولُ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ قُولُوا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ تُفْلِحُوا The Prophet ﷺ would go outside of Mecca to these marketplaces because in Mecca the Quraysh would not let him preach. The Quraysh would basically try to harm his followers and anyone who would stop and listen to him. So again, trying to protect the people from harm, the Prophet ﷺ would actually go to these outer lying marketplaces outside of, Quraysh, outside of Mecca. And there he would go and he would preach to the people. And he said, he says, I remember him saying, I remember seeing him say to the people, Ya you and Nas, O people, say la ilaha illallah, say there is no one worthy of worship but God alone. And tuflihu, you will find success in this life and the next. Next. And the people started to gather up around him to listen to him. And behind him would approach a man. And this man had a very bright, open face. Had a very fair complexion. And this man had very bright cheeks. Again, from the description, you can realize who he's talking about. يَقُولْ إِنَّهُ صَابِئٌ كَاذِبٌ And he would run up behind the Prophet ﷺ and he would say, This man has abandoned the religion of his forefathers. And this man is a liar. He would run up screaming this behind the Prophet ﷺ. يَتْبَعُهُ حَيْثُ ذَهَبٌ he would follow the Prophet ﷺ no matter wherever he went. فَسَأَلْتُ عَنْهُ فَقَالُوا I asked, who is this? What's going on here? 
Like I, I, I wasn't even, you know, I, I heard the message of the Prophet ﷺ, but the behavior of the man was even more bizarre. The elder gentleman's behavior was even more bizarre than what this man was saying. So I asked, who's this old man? Why does he act this way? هَذَا عَمْهُ أَبُو لَهَبْ And they said, this is his uncle Abu Lahab. There are multiple narrations. Another narration that is mentioned by Imam al-Bayhaqi, rahimahullahu ta'ala, he, from Rabi'ah to Daily, he says, رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ بِذِي الْمَجَازِ يَتَّبِعُ النَّاسَ فِي مَنَازِلِهِمْ يَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ that I saw the Prophet ﷺ in that same marketplace and he would go to people and he would call people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَوَرَاءُهُ رَجُلٌ أَحْوَلُ تَقِدُ وَجْنَتَاهُ There was a man behind him <coughs> who was very fair in complexion and he had very bright cheeks. وَهُوَ يَقُولُ أَيُّهَا النَّاسَ لَا يَغُرُّكُمْ هَذَا عَنْ دِينِكُمْ وَدِينِ آبَائِكُمْ Do not let this man deceive you. Do not let this man deter you and deceive you and remove you from the religion of your forefathers. From your religion, the religion of your forefathers. I said, who is this old man acting crazy? Hada Abu Lahab. They told me that this is Abu Lahab. There's yet another narration and he says, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, قُولُوا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهَ تُفْلِحُوا وَإِذَا رَجُلٌ خَلْفَهُ يَشْفِي عَلَيْهِ التُرَابِ A man ran up behind the Prophet ﷺ and had a bunch of dirt in his hand and started to throw dirt on top of the Prophet ﷺ from behind him. وَإِذَا هُوَ أَبُوْ جَهَلْ And one narration says that this is Abu Jahl. Another narration says that no, this is Abu Lahab. وَإِذَا هُوَ يَقُولْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسْ لَا يَغُرُّكُمْ هَذَا عَن دِينِكُمْ that do not let this man deter you from your religion. فَإِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ أَن تَتْرُكُوا عِبَادَةَ اللَّاتِ وَالْعُزَّةِ He wants to remove you from the worship of اللات and عزّة, the idols that you worship. And so we see, and there are other narrations as well, that talk about Abu Lahab literally following the Prophet ﷺ around, throughout the marketplace, carrying a sack of like stones. Pebbles. And as he was walking to distract the Prophet ﷺ, because the Prophet ﷺ would begin to engage in intelligent, enlightening conversation with an individual, he would stop and begin telling them, explaining the Qur'an to them, that Abu Lahab would take these pebbles and start to throw them at the back of the head of the Prophet ﷺ. And you can imagine how disturbing and distracting and how frustrating that would be. And he would start to scream and interrupt the Prophet's conversation with people, say, Don't listen to him. I know him. He's my nephew. Hada ibn Am Hada ibn Akhi. Hada ibn Akhi. Ana Ammuhu. This is the son of my brother. I am his uncle. I know him better than you do. Wahua majnoonun. Kadibun sahirun. He is crazy, he is a liar, he is a magician. Don't listen to him. And he would literally follow the Prophet and follow him around doing this all day long. All day long, distracting people. And he had become such a circus act that people were actually distracted by him. And people would become more curious, who's this crazy man? Who's this crazy old guy running around acting like a lunatic? He had become such a circus act. And he kept going with this. He was so persistent with this. Wherever he would go, in the private family gathering I told you about, he disrupted the gathering. In the public gathering, he's the one who disrupted the gathering near the mountain of Safa. And even when the Prophet ﷺ is going around having personal conversations with people, he's the one that's disrupting these conversations. And he becomes so disruptive of a force. And his wife is also continuing to escalate her opposition to the Prophet ﷺ. She comes every single day, throws trash on the doorstep of the Prophet ﷺ, throws trash on the Prophet ﷺ. And this couple had made it the mission and objective of their lives to do this. Now there's two different sequences in the narration here. I'll give you the more popularly mentioned sequence which is mentioned in more um, well-known books of Sirah, and then I'll tell you the other sequence. The first sequence is that the Prophet ﷺ literally went about his business. He kept doing what he had to do. And he just kept ignoring them, as you should. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a surah in the Qur'an. A surah that we know as Surah Al-Lahab. 
تبت يدا أبي لهب وتب that may Abu Lahab be ruined that Abu Lahab is cursed Abu Lahab is ruined he's destroyed ما أغنى عنه ماله وما كسب that what he's his wealth and what he earns will not help him in the least bit سيصلي نارا ذات لهب and he prides himself on different different things he prides himself on his wealth he prides himself on his economic influence on the marketplace in Mecca that's why Allah talked about his wealth and wama kasab that's why Allah talked about his ability to earn a living his ability to do business because he was throwing his weight around like you don't want to oppose Muhammad you want to believe in Muhammad well you ain't going to be able to do business with me no more you sure you want to do that you sure you want to make an enemy who is the most powerful businessman in Mecca who is the greatest influence in the public marketplace of Mecca? You sure you want to do this? So that's why Allah said, مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَالُهُ Not just his wealth, because he thought he was rich and powerful. And secondly, that's why Allah talked about his ability to be able to earn. Because he was throwing that weight around. سَيَصْلَى نَارًا ذَاتَ لَهَبٍ And then he also prided himself on his looks. Everyone talked about his looks. Abu Lahab, fiery man. The man with fire inside of his cheeks and his face. So Allah said, he will be burned inside of a fire that will have these burning ambers. Oh, he'll be burned. Oh, and we haven't forgotten about his wife. Throws trash on the beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. حَمَّالَةَ الْحَطَبِ Today she carries the trash from her home to the house of the Prophet ﷺ on the day of judgment and in the life of the hereafter. She will carry the firewood, she will carry the stones that will continue to burn the flames in the fire of hell. Like the Qur'an talks about this. قُودُهَا النَّاسِ وَالْحِجَارَةِ People and stones will be the, fire, the fuel of the fire of hell. She will carry those people and she will carry those stones on her neck, on her back to continue burning the fuel, to continue to provide the fuel for the fire of hell. فِي جِيدِهَا حَبَلٌ مِّن مَسَدٍ And around her neck will be a rope and a, a, a shackle, like chains, like a prisoner would be chained with a shackle, with a chain going from, almost like a leash. She will have one like that made out of fire around her neck. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to the defense of the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reprimanded these people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put those people in check. Now this is why I was saying this is one sequence. So this is what happens now. Of course this is a surah of the Qur'an. The Prophet recites it. Mentions it to the scribes of divine revelation. To the sahaba radiallahu anhum. The word gets out. Abu Lahab hears about it. His wife hears about it. They're enraged. They're enraged. At this point in time, two daughters of the Prophet Wasallam, Ummu Kulthum and Ruqayya. They were either engaged to be married or the, the formal English term is betrothed to the two sons of Abu Lahab. Let me explain what that means. It's not quite exactly what we think of an engagement, but what we basically call like the katb al-kitab. The nikah without the rukhsati. Right? So the, the general like basic agreement, the paperwork had been signed, the agreement had been made, that these two sons of Abu Lahab would marry these two daughters of the Prophet ﷺ. But they, the, the, the marriage had not been consummated yet. They had not moved in together yet. That had not occurred yet. So call it an engagement if you will. They had been engaged, but they weren't married. Abu Lahab, furious at this time, goes to his two sons. And the name of the two sons were Utba and Utayba. Utba and Utayba. He goes to his two sons and he says that you right now, right here, immediately will go over to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and you will break it off with his daughters. 
you will go and basically break off the engagement with his daughters and you will humiliate him when you do it and you will curse him out and abuse him at, in doing so. And some of the more detailed narrations tell us that one of the sons came to the Prophet ﷺ, had some level of dignity, some level, and came and said, it's over. My father said, I have to come here. My mom said, I have to come here and say, it's over. And that's it. And he just left. And one the narration, and the narration goes on to mention that the other son came to the Prophet ﷺ, grabbed him by his shirt, ripped his shirt, spit on him, cursed him, and said, keep your daughter at home. I'm done with her. I'm through with her. And humiliated a father in this way. And the Prophet ﷺ was very deeply hurt by this. Anyone who's a parent, anyone who's a father, you know, again, this is something that I oftentimes um, speak about. I speak about this. I wanted to say I rant and I, I rant about this. I complain about this, but I complain to myself. I complain about myself before anyone else. A problem that we have collectively as a community is a lot of times when we talk about the life and the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, it becomes such a ritual routine thing to us. Where we just read it like we're reading a Wikipedia page. We just say it, like I just said it. They went over there, they broke it off with the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ, and then next, and next, and next. No, 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 try to understand what that means. Try to understand what that means. If you're a father, and even then, if you have a daughter, and on top of that, if your daughters are older, and may God, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect everyone, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not inflict this type of pain on anyone, but if you, God forbid, have ever been in a situation where your daughter was, you know, the engagement with your daughter was broken off, or may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect everyone, but if somebody's daughter was ever divorced, you know this pain. It's heartbreaking. It's gut-wrenching. Grown men, grown men, who are a symbol of strength and courage and power for their families, for their communities, will cry themselves to sleep because of the pain that that situation inflicts on a person. If you've never experienced that, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you. Maybe take a look at somebody who has gone through that. If you're close to someone like that, go and talk to them, ask them what it's like. Being in the position that we're in, being in the position that I'm in, I have people come and talk to me about it these situations. I've had very accomplished, intelligent, admirable, honorable, dignified, strong men who I look up to. I call them uncles. I admire them. They're role models to me. But when their daughters go through this type of a situation or go through this type of a tragedy, I've had those same individuals Come and sit down in front of me and cry tears endlessly. They can't speak. Their voices shake and tremble. They feel like their world has been destroyed. It's a very serious thing. We're not even talking about the pain and the suffering of those, those daughters. Umm Kuthum and Ruqayya radiallahu anhumah. May Allah be pleased with them. What they must have gone through here. And of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them something better. They were married to Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu. One of the most amazing men that ever walked the face of this earth after the prophets. But if we focus in on the seerah, we're talking about the prophets sallallahu Imagine what that pain is like for a parent, for a father. It, it can break a person. Imagine how painful that was for the prophet sallallahu See, this is when seerah will change our lives. This will have an impact on us. When we try to understand it. When we try to actually feel it. 
And then if this happens through a formality or this happens very respectfully, it's still traumatic and tragic. Imagine if it happens like this. Somebody disrespects you, dishonors you. Somebody humiliates you. Imagine how tough that is to deal with, how tough that is to overcome. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ went through here. So this was some of the initial pain and suffering of the Prophet ﷺ. That there was public disapproval, but before anyone else could say anything, could take a position, could align themselves with him or against him, because everybody was still trying to understand and figure this situation out, and kind of understand what was going on. Before any of that, before any of that, you had the own uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Lahab. Who the Prophet ﷺ would have hoped that as influential as he was, he would be a voice on the side of the Prophet ﷺ, campaigning for the Prophet ﷺ, standing by the side of the Prophet ﷺ, putting an arm around him, saying, I got his back. But he was the most vocal, he did not wait for a day, he lashed out, jumped at the opportunity to be able to not just say, I don't agree with him, but then to curse him out in public, to humiliate him in public, to disrespect him, to throw dirt at him, to throw rocks at him, to curse him, to slander him, to launch a campaign against him, and not only that, but attack his own children. Imagine how challenging those first few initial days were. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ was dealing with. But on the other side, there was something else that was developing at the same time. There was one of the other uncles of the Prophet ﷺ, a very beloved uncle to the Prophet ﷺ by the name of Abu Lahab. Now if you are a student of the seerah, the prophetic biography, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Lahab is no stranger to you. You know very well who Abu, uh, excuse me, Abu Talib is no stranger to you. Abu Talib is no stranger to you. You know exactly who Abu Talib is. And if you've been attending these Sira classes here, then you are very well informed about who Abu Talib was and what he meant to the Prophet ﷺ. This was a man who was close to the Prophet ﷺ from his birth. He was actually one of the most attached people to the father of the Prophet ﷺ. The father of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdullah, he was extremely close to Abu Talib. He had many older brothers, Abbas, Hamza radiallahu anhu, very possibly was younger than the father, he actually was younger than the father of the Prophet ﷺ, and that's why he was very close to the Prophet ﷺ in age. But Abbas, Abu Lahab, there were many different older brothers, but the one that he was the closest to was Abu Talib. He was very close to him. And therefore Abu Talib had a great affinity for Muhammad ibn Abdullah, had a, had, a lot of, had a lot of love for the only child of his brother who passed away too young. Who passed away as a young man. Abu Talib was heartbroken at the loss of his younger brother that he was so close to. And that's why he had a lot of love for his nephew. And then on top of that, I talked about here in these Sira sessions, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather, who had taken care of the Prophet, who was very in love with this beautiful child, who loved him like one of his own, especially when his beloved son Muhammad, uh, when his beloved son Abdullah, the son of Muhammad, uh, the, the father of Muhammad, passed away. Abdul Muttalib developed a lot of love for this innocent child who had lost his father, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And he loved him. And especially then when the mother of Muhammad, Amina passes away, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when, when the mother of the Prophet sallallahu passes away, then Abdul Muttalib basically takes it upon himself to love and to nurture this child. His grandson, his beloved grandson, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. When Abdul Muttalib is passing away, and I've talked about this, when Abdul Muttalib is passing away, he tells his son, his most trusted son, the son that he has, that he has basically um, groomed and trained to take over the leadership of Banu Hashim and the leadership of Quraysh, Abu Talib, a selfless, 
socially conscious, civically engaged, responsible family man, Abu Talib, he, one of the last dying requests, one of the last requests, like his wasiya to his son, Abu Talib, is please take care of my grandson Muhammad. I put you in charge of him. He doesn't have his father. He doesn't have his mother. All he's had is me. I'm all that he has. And I'm dying. I'm an old man. I'm dying. I need you to promise me that you'll take care of him. And you've seen how much I care for him. That you'll take care of him just like I did. And Abu Talib on the deathbed of his father, Abdul Muttalib, holds his father's hand and promises to him that father, I will take care of my nephew Muhammad. I'll take care of him. He's the son of my dear, dearly departed brother Abdullah. I will care for him. You can trust me. And from that day on, Abu Talib made it the mission of his life to take care and to make sure that Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa knew that he was loved. He knew that he was loved. And that was the relationship of Abu Talib with the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Now that the Prophet sallallahu proclaims his message, and one of the narrations that I didn't talk about earlier, I was saving it for here, is that In one of those, in, in some of the narrations say in the third of those three gatherings, where the Prophet ﷺ just gathered the men of Banu Hashim together, the family private dinner, the gathering, Abu Talib actually spoke up in defense of the Prophet ﷺ. He did put his support behind him. He says, I support you. I don't, ex- I don't myself understand or believe in what you're presenting, but I got your back. You say what you got to say. You do what you got to do. And, the, and some of the narrations say that was part of the reason why Abu Lahab was so infuriated. Because while he was the most influential person economically in Mecca, in Quraysh, civically and socially the most influential person, and the de facto leader of Banu Hashim, for that same reason, because one of the things that basically were the crown of the leader of Banu Hashim in Quraysh was the caretaking of the, the custodianship of the Kaaba, of the Haram. And taking care of the visitors of, to the Haram, to the Kaaba, the, the Hujjaj. And that was being done by Abu Talib, the civic social leader. And at the end of the day, that would be more publicly visible, and that at the end of the day would be a little bit more influential. If not in amongst Banu Hashim or Quraysh, or at least not amongst the business class, the businessmen of Banu Hashim, Quraysh and Mecca, then especially in the rest of Arabia. Because he was the public figure that they would see. He was the face that they would know. And if he was going to stand here and say, I got your back, son. I got your back, dear nephew. You say what you gotta say. Abu Lahab felt threatened from the very beginning. And that's part of the reason why he became so aggressive in his opposition to the Prophet ﷺ and his message. So Abu Talib got the back of the Prophet ﷺ. The narration say, وَكَانَ It says, وَخَالَفَهُ فِي ذَلِكَ عَمُّهُ أَبُو طَالِبْ بِنْ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ However, Abu Talib, he opposed Abu Lahab. He opposed Abu Lahab in his response to the Prophet ﷺ. وَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم أَحَبَّ خَلْقِ اللَّهِ إِلَيْهِ طَبَعًا And the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, may Allah's peace and blessings shower down upon him. He was the most beloved of God's creation to Abu Talib. Abu Talib loved him more than he loved anyone else. فَكَانَ يَحْنُوا عَلَيْهِ وَيُحْسِنُوا إِلَيْهِ He used to shower him with, a, with love and affection. And he would always do right by him. anhu, And he would defend him. وَيُحَامِي And he, would, he was very loyal to him. وَيُخَالِفُ قَوْمَهُ فِي ذَلِكَ And he would oppose the people in trying to harm the Prophet ﷺ. مَعَا أَنَّهُ عَلَى دِينِهِمْ وَعَلَى خُلَّتِهِمْ Even though he himself might have still believed in the religion of the people, he still defended and protected and um, supported the Prophet ﷺ. 
So it goes on to say, Fakana, it goes on to basically talk about how he kept protecting and kept defending the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he had the back of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, in supporting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and publicly stating, I got your back, you do what you have to do. I talked about the narrations previously that when he saw Ali ibn Abi Talib, his own son, who was given into the care of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam praying with Khadija, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, somebody that Abu Talib had approved of their marriage and Abu Talib had recommended this marriage as well. He sees them praying together and he sees his own son Ali ibn Abi Talib, he sees his own son praying with the Prophet ﷺ. And, Abu, and Ali radiallahu anhu was very nervous when his father found out. He tells his son, he goes, son, I approve. Muhammad's a good man. Muhammad's a good man. He's honest, I raised him like one of my own. And I trusted him to raise you. You listen to him, you follow him, and you try to be like him. I might not understand this part of it. This worshiping one God, this praying and all this stuff. But what I do understand is his honesty and his trustworthiness and his love and his generosity and his kindness and his respect and his consideration for his family. He cares for me. I'm an old man now. I struggle with my responsibilities. I struggle financially, but he's always there for me. He's a man of great integrity. You follow him, you stay with him, you listen to him. And you try to pick up some of this integrity that Muhammad has. And, the, and Abu Talib supported the Islam of Ali radiallahu anhu. He supported it. So now that to some extent initially, now this is still very early in Mecca. I want to remind you of this. I'm taking my time here. A lot of seerah books that you might have read, like basic summarized seerah books that you might have read, by now, it's talking about the migration to Abyssinia. We're already there. Literally, we're from here to the migration to Abyssinia. The Prophet stands on Safa, preaches to people, Abu Lahab responds negatively, Abu Talib responds positively, migration to Abyssinia. But I want to point out something here, because this is exactly what I pointed out in the beginning of the Seerah session. That's why we spent so much time on his birth, on his childhood, on his youth, on his marriage, on his family life. That's why we spend so much time here. It's because there are some lessons to learn here. You see that some of the lines are starting to be drawn. Some lines are starting to be drawn. And this is a lesson that we need to remember as the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, especially us here, and, and I'll clarify who I'm speaking to just in case somebody listens to these recordings afterwards. I'm speaking about Muslims as a minority, particularly here in America. We have to keep this in mind. When we are still a fledgling, small, infant community. I'm not disrespecting, denying that there are Muslims who have been here for a hundred years. Even before there was mass immigration from the Muslim world, from the Middle East, from the subcontinent, from the Far East, there was migration to this country, 70s, 80s, and 90s, continuing till now. Even before that, there were convert communities that were present here. A hundred years ago, even dating far back further than that. But this much is still true that those were still very, very small, isolated communities. They were a few individuals. But when we talk about us as an actual major visible community, it's a very recent thing. And even if we were to say we're a hundred years old, that's nothing. That's nothing. I mean, it takes a long time to actually make a mark in a place. And so we're still a very small fledgling infant community and we're finding our feet. And day by day we're becoming more and more visible. And people are getting to know more and more about us and understand exactly who we are. So we have to keep something in mind from this early period of the seerah. That when we go out there and we tell the message for the very first time, we'll be met with a lot of confused looks. People might not outright disrespect or disregard us. Or, or rather, people might not just flock to us all of a sudden. I know we're very excited and very enthralled by the, by the shahadas that we receive. And alhamdulillah, it's a blessing that so many people convert to Islam. But at the end of the day, how many people is it? You know, uh, per major metropolitan city, a dozen people a week? 
But then how many millions of people live in that city? So, but slowly but surely, we're very grateful and thankful to Allah. We're not, we don't want to demoralize ourselves, but we're moving forward slowly. So while the masses might not be rushing, saying, yes, we love this, we support this, we believe in you, we understand. And at the same time, the vast overwhelming majority of people might not be rushing to burn our masajid to the ground and crucify us and you know, hang us from the trees. Maybe that's not happening either. Majority of the people are just trying to understand and figure out exactly what's going on. It's something new that they've heard. And they're trying to come to terms with it, trying to come to grips with it. And we see that from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. That's what most of Quraysh, that's what most of Makkah is doing. Most of Makkah is at home just kind of talking about it like, Hey, did you hear? Did you hear? Well, what do you think? What do you think? I don't know. I don't know either. That's what most of Makkah is doing right now. But there will be a few people. Some people are believing. Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali, Khadija, Zayd ibn Haritha, Abdurrahman bin Auf, Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, Sumayya, Ummu Ammar. Some people are believing. Some people are, are starting to line up behind him. Some people are outright just, just completely open about their complete disdain, disapproval, and wanting to completely stop this altogether. Like Abu Lahab, launching a public campaign. Muhammad's crazy, he's a liar, we need to stop this now. And everyone who believes in him is a traitor to his people. And then there are some people who don't believe necessarily, a few people, who don't believe, but still support. Say no. They're good people. He saying what he says, I might not understand, I might not agree. But at the end of the day, that's my opinion. And he is entitled and he has every right to his opinion. And at the end of the day, he's somebody who is good, somebody who is beneficial, and somebody who does not harm his people. So I have to stand here and support him and support his right to be able to live his life and believe and preach what he believes in. And that's Abu Talib. And so we see this is the initial scene. When we look at us right here, right now, we'll learn a lot of lessons here. So what do we see? What do we have to basically understand? That the people, when we are in this type of a situation, the people who openly oppose us, there is no benefit there is no benefit in flinging mud back at somebody who is flinging mud. There's no benefit in that. There's no benefit in stooping down to somebody's level. Somebody curses you out, somebody slanders you, somebody says something bad about you, somebody disrespects you. There's no benefit in disrespecting them. You're stupid. Oh yeah, you're ugly. Like there's no benefit in that. La khayra fi. There's no benefit in this. It's immature, childish behavior. And it actually contradicts your own message. If you preach faith and you preach dignity and honor and nobility, well, you didn't act that way. You said it, but you didn't act it. And that's a common problem we as Muslims have. Again, some people might be a little sensitive. In America right now, we do get bullied, on, uh, bullied around. We do get picked on quite often. If it's not Murfreesboro, it's not a masjid being vandalized. If it's not some crazy guy on radio or TV talking bad about us, then it's something else or something else and somebody making something stupid on YouTube and putting it out there or somebody drawing some cartoons, publishing them in the newspaper, etc, etc. Yes, people are messing with us. But at the same time, we can't really control what they do. We, we can influence, we can have some type of an impact on them, but that first begins with ourselves, rallying our own communities together and then being able to appeal to the senses and the sensibilities of the general society that we are a part of. So first and foremost, we got to check ourselves before we check anyone else. And a lot of times we do not respond and react properly. We stoop to their levels. If somebody posts, posts something bad, says something bad about Muslims or Islam about the Prophet on Facebook, and you go there and you leave a comment on their Facebook post where you leave a few four-letter choice, four-letter words, 
You go there and you curse them out and you leave profanities there. You, did a, you just did a terrible, terrible thing. You did not put nobody in check. You did not defend Islam. You did more harm to Islam than that fool did on his Facebook. Because you didn't stand up, you, you didn't represent Islam. You are a Muslim. Anyone else who is mildly intelligent or educated would say that that person is an ignorant, uneducated person who does not know Islam, does not know Muslims, and that person is, is, is reprehensible for doing that to begin with. But when you go out and you do that, now somebody's going to say, but man, look at this Muslim, look how he behaved, look how he acted. So we have to be careful of our own behavior. The Prophet ﷺ is not stooping to the level of Abu Lahab. He's not becoming like Abu Lahab in response to Abu Lahab. He's taking the high road. Dignify yourself. Dignify your faith, your religion, your ummah. Your messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa Abu Talib is supportive. And the Prophet ﷺ does not take his support for granted. I'm going to tell you a story right now. But the Prophet ﷺ does not take the support of Abu Talib for granted. He does not. But he appreciates it. And he makes sure, he expresses to Abu Talib, his beloved uncle, I do not wish to become a burden on you. I didn't want to make your life difficult. Please forgive me, uncle. But I'm just doing what I have to do. And then the Prophet ﷺ is taking care of, he's nurturing, he's supporting, he's trying to protect those people who do believe in him from falling into harm's way, from getting caught in the crossfire. And we basically are going to have to adopt a similar philosophy and take a lesson from this and go forward with this. What time is Salat al Isha today? 9 o'clock, okay. So we have a little bit of time. So I'm going to take probably about 10 to 12 more minutes because I'd like to tell you this one little story. This is a very well known story from the seerah, from the life of the Prophet. It talks about the Quraysh approaching Abu Talib. Very famous story. Aqil bin Abi Talib, who's one of the sons of Abu Talib, who accepted Islam later, he says, Ja'at Quraysh ila Abi Talib. Quraysh came to my father Abu Talib. And they said, Inna ibn akhika hadha qad adhana fi nadina wa masjidina. That this nephew of yours, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He's really, really caused us a lot of difficulty and he's become a real nuisance to us. You know, in our marketplaces, at the haram, he's become a real nuisance to us. Fanhahu anna. Tell him to stop. Abu Talib said, Ya Aqil, in taliq fa'tini bi Muhammad. He said, Aqil, go and go get your cousin, Muhammad. Go get my beloved nephew, Muhammad. Need to talk to him. Fan talaqtu ilayhi fas. تَخْرَجْتُهُ مِنْ كِبْسٍ أَوْ قَالَ حِفْشٍ يَقُولُ بَيْتٍ صَغِيرٍ فَجَاءَهُ بِهِ فِي الظَّهِيرَةِ فِي شِدَّةِ الْحَرِّ Anyways, he says basically, I went to the Prophet ﷺ and I basically, he was in a small home, he was in a small house at that time, and I went and I got him and brought him to uh, my father Abu Talib, his uncle Abu Talib. And he actually describes the time because it plays into the scene. Again, these details are preserved because you're supposed to try to visualize what this is like. He said it was the hottest part of the day. The hottest part of the day. Imagine like 2, 3 p.m. Texas. In the summertime in Texas, noon is bad. But actually 2, 3 p.m. is worse. Because the heat's just been building all day. It's been just, it's just been pouring down. Everything's on fire at that time. So imagine 2, 3 p.m. That hot, hottest time of the day. He says the Prophet ﷺ came in that time. So imagine the sun bearing down, sweating from, you know, sweating all over, coming in that extreme heat, and arriving to his uncle. He says, Inna bani ammika. فَلَمَّا أَتَاهُمْ قَالَ إِنَّ بَنِي عَمِّكَ هَؤُلَا زَعَمُوا أَنَّكَ تُؤْذِيهِمْ فِي نَادِيهِمْ وَمَسْجِدِيهِمْ فَانْتَهِي عَنْ آذَاهُمْ He says that these, these cousins of mine, إِنَّ بَنِي عَمِّكَ Or excuse me, he says that these cousins of yours. That was basically a way of saying, these are your brothers. These are your people. 
These are your family members. Inna bani ammika. Your cousins. All of these people, they say that you cause them a lot of harm. That you cause them a lot of difficulty, a lot of trouble and adversity. So please, stop, call, stop bothering them, stop troubling them. فَحَلَّقَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم بِبَصَرِهِ لَسَّمَاءِ One narration says the Prophet ﷺ looked up at the sky. فَقَالْ تَرَوْنَ هَذِهِ الشَّمْسِ Remember it's the hottest part of the day. 2-3 p.m. you can see the sun right there. He says, تَرَوْنَ هَذِهِ الشَّمْسِ Do you see the sun? قَالُوا نَعَمْ They said, of course we do. The Prophet ﷺ says, فَمَا أَنَا بِأَقْدَرْ عَلَىٰ أَنْ أَدْعَى ذَلِكَ مِنْكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنْ, تش... على أن تس... تَشْعِلُوا مِنْهَا شُعْلَةً and The Prophet ﷺ said that I am not capable of going to this sun and bringing you back a flame from this sun. قَالَ أَبُوْ طَالِبْ وَاللَّهِ مَا كَذَبَ إِبْنُ أَخِي قَطُّ so the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam basically what he was said it's a figure of speech in Arabic he says فَمَا أَنَا بِأَقْدَرْ عَلَىٰ أَنْ أَدْعَى ذَلِكَ مِنْكُمْ I am no more capable of stopping I am no more capable of stopping my preaching to you spreading my message preaching my message to you than I am any more capable of going to the sun and bringing back a flame from there that just like I'm not capable, I just cannot go to the sun and bring a flame from there for you, I cannot stop preaching my message to you. I can't. I'm sorry, I just can't. Abu, Abu Talib responded by saying, I swear by God that this nephew of mine has never lied. Now you people go from here. This is a narration of Bukhari. Another narration which might sound a little more familiar to you is that when the Quraysh came and they basically said to Abu Talib that look, you know, your nephew is causing us so much trouble, so much difficulty. So please tell him to stop. When the Prophet ﷺ finally came to Abu Talib, and Abu Talib said that, look, these people say that you cause them so much difficulty, please stop bothering them. Abu, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ responded to Abu Talib by saying, Ya Ammi, O oh my dear beloved uncle, لَوْ وُضِعَتِ الشَّمْسُ فِي يَمِينِ لَوْ وُضِعَتِ الشَّمْسُ فِي يَمِينِ That if the sun was put in my right hand, وَالْقَمَرُ فِي يَسَارِ and the moon was put in my left hand. مَا تَرَكْتُ هَذَا الْأَمْرَ حَتَّى يُظْهِرُهُ اللَّهُ أَوْ أَهْلِكَ فِي طَلَبِهِ I, if the sun was put in my right hand and the moon was put in my left hand, مَا تَرَكْتُ هَذَا الْأَمْرَ I would not stop preaching the true message of God until either Allah had made His message apparent on the earth or I would die in trying to do so. I just can't stop. This is my job, this is my mission, this is what I'm doing. And then it says, ثُمَّ اسْتَعْبَرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ And then the Prophet ﷺ teared up. The Prophet ﷺ teared up. فَبَكَى And he cried. Tears streamed down his face from his eyes. And he started to turn and walk away from there. Some of the narrations and even some of the scholars of Sirah talk about why was the Prophet ﷺ crying? Some have said that because he thought that Abu Talib, his uncle, had given up his aid and his support. That Abu Talib would no longer have his back. And so the Prophet ﷺ was worried or he was hurt by this. Some of the other scholars of Sirah actually say, and this is something that makes, personally to me, makes more sense. The Prophet ﷺ was brought to tears by the thought that he had bothered and troubled his uncle Abu Talib. This man had raised him. This man had loved him. Took care of him. And this man had supported him so strongly. And the Prophet ﷺ was very saddened he was doing what he had to do. 
He wasn't. He didn't regret his choice. He didn't regret doing what he did. That wasn't the case. He didn't regret none of that. He wasn't disappointed. But at the same time, the Prophet ﷺ was just hurt by the fact that maybe his uncle was hurt. Maybe his uncle was troubled. He's old, he's elderly. He's done so much for me. He's, ma- he, he, he's been such a huge part of me being the man that I am today. And in the old part of his life, the twilight years of his life, I've brought him pain and I've brought him difficulty and I've brought this trouble to his doorstep. He's an old man, he should just play with his grandkids and do what he has to do. And now he has all these people here constantly harassing him and bothering him. Because of me, I wish I could have brought him more comfort and ease and not been a source of difficulty for him. And that brought the Prophet ﷺ to tears because he cared about him, he loved him. I wish I hadn't done this to my dear uncle. And the Prophet ﷺ turned from there, just saddened by the situation, tears streaming down his face. And when he turned from there and Abu Talib looked up and saw the condition of the Prophet ﷺ walking away from there, saddened, he said, Yabna akhi, Yabna akhi, dear beloved nephew. And the Prophet ﷺ turned back and looked back at Abu Talib. Tears, red eyes, tears. He said, Imdi ala amrika. You keep doing what you gotta do, son. Wafa'al ma ahbabta. And you do whatever it is that you want to do. Fawallahi la uslimuka li shayin. Abadan. Because I will never leave your side. I will never give you up to these people. I will never stop defending you. I've, I'm always there for you. And then Ibn Ishaq in his seerah mentions that Abu Talib then recited some couplets of poetry. He said, Wallahi, لَن يَصِلُوا إِلَيْكَ بِجَمْعِهِمْ حَتَّى أُوَسَّدَ فِي التُّرَابِ دَفِينَا فَمْضِ لِأَمْرِكَ مَا عَلَيْكَ غَضَادَةٌ أَبَشِرْ وَقَرَّ بِذَلِكَ مِنْكَ عُيُونًا وَدَعَوْتَنِي وَعَلِمْتُ أَنَّكَ نَاصِحِي فَلَقَدْ صَدَقْتَ وَكُنْتَ قِدْمُ أَمِينًا وَعَرَضْتَ دِينًا قَدْ عَرَفْتُ بِأَنَّهُ مِنْ خَيْرِ أَدْيَانِ الْبَرِيَّةِ دِينًا لَوْلَا الْمَلَامَةُ أَوْ حِذَارِي سُبَّةً لَوَجَدْتَنِي سُمْحًا بِذَلِكَ مُبِينًا he says that, Wallahi لَنْ يَصِلُوا إِلَيْكَ بِجَمْعِهِمْ I swear to God, I swear by Allah, that all of them, if they get together, they will not be able to reach you and harm you. حَتَّى أُوَسَّدَ فِي التُّرَابِ دَفِينَا Until and unless I am laid to rest in my grave. Until I'm put in my grave, I will not let these people reach you. فَمْضِي لِأَمْرِكَ مَا عَلَيْكَ غَضَادَةٌ You keep doing what you have to do, what you believe in doing. أَبْشِرْ وَقَرَّ بِذَلِكَ مِنْكَ عُيُونًا And be, be proud of what you do. And know that you bring people happiness and comfort and tranquility because of what you do. وَدَعَوْتَنِي I know you've called me to believe in what you say. وَعَلِمْتُ أَنَّكَ نَاسِحِي And I know that you only want what's good for me. فَلَقَدْ صَدَقْتَ You have spoken the truth, beloved nephew. وَكُنْتَ قِدْمُ أَمِينًا And you have always been truthful and trustworthy. وَعَرَضْتَ دِينًا And you have presented a way of life to me. قَدْ عَرَفْتُ بِأَنَّهُ مِنْ خَيْرِ أَدْيَانِ الْبَرِيَّةِ دِينًا And I have no doubt that this is the best way of life that can be found on the face of this earth. But understand, nephew, my own weakness. لَوْلَا الْمَلَامَةُ If I, if it wasn't for people saying bad things about me, أو حِذَارِي سُبَّةً Or me being afraid of people cursing me in my old age, لَوَجَدْتَنِي سَمْحًا بِذَلِكَ مُبِينًا I would have totally believed in you, and I would have joined you in your belief. But I can't do that for my own weakness and my own reasons. But no, at the same time, I'm standing right here behind you, in front of you. Defending you, and you keep doing what you have to do. This was the defense of Abu Talib for the Prophet ﷺ. And this only further solidified the love that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ had for his beloved uncle Abu Talib. And this was that third angle 
that I was talking about that the Prophet of Allah وسلم, in these early stages of Makkah, there were people who believed, who we will talk a little bit more about next session. We'll talk about the first 40 believers and we'll talk about, we'll, get, we'll go through their names and talk a little bit about them. So there were the believers obviously, and we'll talk more about that next session. There were the people who opposed, and we talked about Abu Lahab in detail, and how the mandate of the Prophet وسلم, was not to stoop to their level of nastiness, but to rise above them, ignore them, and keep doing what he had to do. And then there was a third element. The third element was that which supported the Prophet ﷺ, defended the Prophet ﷺ, maybe didn't believe, but still defended him and supported him. And how did the Prophet ﷺ engage with them? He appreciated their defense. He appreciated their support. And he actually even apologized for being a cause of difficulty and trouble to them. Which only increased them in their support and love and appreciation of who the Prophet ﷺ was. I pray and I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us all the mercy, uh, gives us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to emulate the qualities and the conduct of the Prophet ﷺ. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all a better understanding of the life and the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu You know, I, talk, I spoke about this last week as well. Just real quickly, in a nutshell, this is very important. This is very important in the midst of everything else that happens. You know, terrible things are said or written or drawn about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and that's terrible. And then some Muslims behave very negatively to that, do things that are in contradiction to the teachings in the life of the Prophet sallallahu But at the end of the day, it's very good that we went on Facebook, we went online, we watched a YouTube video, we clicked like on a statement, and we were aware of what happened. But at the end of the day, if we do not productively, proactively do something that remedies this issue, this, will, this is a cycle that will continue to repeat itself. We cannot be. I was just talking to some youth yesterday at UTD, at a university here in town. I remember in my lifetime, Salman Rushdie, and then a few years ago, there were the cartoons. And now there was a YouTube. This is a cycle that will continue to repeat itself. And unfortunately, our behavior will also repeat itself. If we do not right the ship. And in order to do that, make a very minimal effort. Take out 20 minutes of your week. Your week. This is Texas. How much football do we watch a week here? By now, if you're any level of a football fan, you spend hours reading and watching clips and talking about how bad the officiating was in Monday Night Football last night. And somebody said, it was terrible, astaghfirullah. Right? Astaghfirullah, brother. Right? It was pretty terrible, I'll admit. But if we can spend hours and hours dedicated towards that, I hate to be that guy, but if we can spend hours and hours, 20 minutes a week, read a little bit of seerah. If you can't even make the time to read, download these recordings, put them on your phone, and when you drive to work and you drive home from work, just play it and listen to it. Educate yourself. When you go home today, talk a little bit about what we talked about today with your children, with your wife, with your family. Share it with some friends, with some co-workers tomorrow. If we don't start this, unfortunately, Maybe a couple of years down the road, the cycle will just repeat itself. We gotta break the cycle. And that'll happen by investing ourselves into knowing and learning and then teaching humanity about who Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us give us all the ability to study the seerah. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanallah bihamdi, subhanakallah bihamdik, nashadwallah ilaha illa anta, nasakfiruku wa natabu ilaykum.